In our recent edition, Oscar, Aprica, Oksana, Sephora, Jerusha, Mercedes Emil, um, Gideon, little wine there, two years old, Alias, Armani, our oldest, Maxine and Ludwig, our twin boys. Wow. This is it. <laughs> So, um, yes, Baruch Hashem, praise God, amen, amen. amen. Almost full. <laughs> we're, we're happy with where we're at, definitely. All right, so let, whatever the Lord brings us, yes, we'll accept all the gifts. Um, so... I will have them go back sit, but let's first um, I'll open up in prayer. Um, I've prepared some things connected to this week's portion. I have a few of our children come up and share some of their... Um, so we've been blessed to go to Israel twice, but in 2018, there's some things that happened. Actually, both times. You never go to Israel and come back unchanged, right? Yeah. And so um, they'll have a chance to share uh, their vision statements and how we what happened there, and then uh, we'll wrap up with a... Simple story, but I think that is very powerful. That um, I think helps us keep, keep our eyes on the Lord. So, Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this opportunity that we have. Um, thank you for filling this, this place with your presence, Father. And thank you that wherever we go, your presence is there and it's felt. And Father, we just uh, want to make ourselves available as vessels to be filled up by you and to uh, fill each other up also, Father. Allow me to let you speak. Less of me, more of you, Father, that uh, this, these things that we're going to share, myself, Maximilian, Ludwig, Armani, and Emil, that uh, they also be uh, filled with your power, Father, and that uh, we can be uh, returned home and refilled, revigorated, um, and um, just um, re renewed in our vision, Father, and, uh, and just following your footsteps and trusting in you. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. 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 Okay, so this week's... Torah portion. This isn't this week's Torah portion, but I always like to put some context. So a little bit of context. Genesis 12, we'll go back a little bit. God calls Abraham. He says, leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. Pretty common, especially in the Messianic <laughs> community. Uh, this is nothing new, but it's always good to go back. And what I like is, how do I go forward? Just like this? Right hand? Click this way? Perfect. Okay. So just to put things in perspective, to, in times of size and distance, Abraham was there in Ur when God first called him. And this is the journey he had to travel. And if you look at the scale there, on the bottom, about an inch or so is 100 miles. So you do the addition, it's roughly, I estimated, about a 1,000-mile journey. That's a long journey. And I connected with that because a few years back in 2016, my family and I were called to move from Southern California to Oregon. And we did that trip many times. It's a 17-hour drive or so. We did it in about 20 hours, uh, typically. It's a long road trip, and this is at 65 miles an hour. Imagine doing that with all your, your donkeys and your camels and your it was a long trip and he wasn't alone he had a lot of richness so it was a big thing for Abraham to be called and he made it always to all the way to Shechem on the right hand side there the two little blue blurbs there the Sea of Galilee up on top and the Dead Sea on the bottom and Shechem is sort of midway between that um, and one of the things we did when we went to Israel is we had a chance to visit Ilan Moray, which is where God met him once he arrived in Shechem. So that's a picture of us in 2015, I think, this one. Beautiful sight, wonderful. And today you've got Jewish communities up top. This is Ilan Moray is a, a little mountain. And down in the bottom you've got the Arab communities. So that's how the people in that area live today, surrounded with, uh, um, we call them Palestinians, Arabs. Uh, people who live there, the Canaanites of today, <laughs> I guess you could say. Um, so, um, connecting a little bit Abraham's faith here, if you read in Hebrews, just going into the New Testament for a little bit, um, it was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave and go to another land that God would give him as his inheritance. He went without knowing where he was going. Do you feel like that sometimes in your life? Yeah. You're going somewhere. I mean, most of the days in my life, I feel like I don't know where I'm going, but I just get a sense this is the direction I need to go. 
And even when he reached the land God promised him, he lived there by faith. For he was like a foreigner living in tents, and so did Isaac and Jacob, who inherited the same promise. Abraham was confidently looking to a city with eternal foundations, a city designed and built by God. Hebrews 11, 8 and 9. That's the vision that Abraham had. He was looking way ahead of him. Right? And that was the calling that God gave him. A uh, little bit of lineage and context in terms of time. So when Abraham first got called by God in Ur, he was 75, and he was asked to go to Canaan. Um, Isaac was born when he was 100, you remember that? And then at 140 years old is when, approximately that time is when Sarah died, which is today's Torah portion where it starts, and which is also when Abraham asked Eliezer to go back to his homeland, a thousand mile journey, to go bring a wife for Isaac. So Isaac marries it at 40 years old, but Abraham was 140. And finally, Abraham dies at 175. This is where our story this week ends. It's a little bit of context and perspective. The lineage, and you can see that Esau and Jacob were 15 years old when Abraham died. Doesn't clearly say it in the story, but I thought it was an interesting point to point out. So let's start with first section, the burial of Sarah. There's a common thread. There's so many things you can pull out of today's Torah portion, but there is a common thread that I thought I would pull out and then connect with what my children are going to be sharing later. So the first thing, the first section on the burial of Sarah, attributes of Abraham you can see. Number one, Sarah died in the land of Canaan. It was also known as Kiryat Arba which today is called Hebron. And I'll just show you some pictures because we had a chance to visit Hebron. Um, Abraham, while he was there, he said, I'm a stranger in a strange land. Keep in mind, he was 140 years old, and he probably arrived in the land of Canaan. Well, his first calling was at 75. Probably took a year journey, roughly. Who knows? It was around 75, so a lot of time has gone, and yet he's still saying, I'm a stranger in a strange land. I will pay full price, so I will have a permanent burial place for my family. Sword doesn't clearly say it, but I believe this was his first official land purchase at 140 years old. Again, how many years has gone, right? And yet he's still holding on to that promise. So connecting this to Hebrews, if they had longed for the country they came from, they could have gone back, but they were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. I read somewhere that it was custom for people to bury their dead with their ancestors, which means he could have thought of going back to Ur to bury Sarah. But no, he purchased the land and he stayed there. Why? Because of God's promise, right? He stayed true, steadfast to that. This is the cave of Machpelah. Up on there, you can see this little flag. It's, it's a Muslim symbol, essentially, and that's because they built a Muslim mosque over the years. But inside there, when you go visit, there's the cave where in down, deep down behind, they say, this is where Sarah Abraham and all the patriarchs uh, were buried. Uh, so we got a chance to visit this. This is actually a picture we took. Um, but you don't go in Hebron today without being escorted by these guys which is what we, we had to do. You don't go there alone, trust me. There's a, a few families, Jewish families, that are holding the Kiv Machpela, and everything else is pretty much like this, and this is all Arabs that just want to eat them alive, almost, pretty much. And there was a lot of, um, the time we were, one of the times we were there, there was actually riots in the street that were happening because, as we hear, there's some terrorists that had been killed. They wanted to have their bodies back, but the IDF wasn't releasing them, and so there was a lot of riot and commotion happening. So this is what it looks like today. It's not, they're not Canaanites like in the time of Abraham, but it kind of feels the same in a way. Um, these would be Arabs living there today. Okay, so in the second section, again, there's a common thread, right? Abraham says, okay, Sarah's dead. Um, it's time, he asked Eliezer, please go and find a wife for Isaac. And he gave him some requirements. The three first bullets are the requirements that Abraham gave him. He says, she must not be a local Canaanite woman. Obviously, if he got a promise to inherit this land, he didn't want to have people from that land that were adverse to that promise to be part of his lineage. So he, again, held fast to that promise that God gave him. Uh, he wanted somebody from his homeland and relatives, probably because he trusted their values and their belief system and everything. Uh, and then, obviously, if you think about it, she had to travel back, right? 
And Eliezer, one of the signs he asks is, I want to see a servant heart. When I ask water, show me that it's the right one by the fact that she will want to also water all my camels and, and all the other men that were with him. So servant heart, that was kind of a good thing to have when you're looking for the wife of your master's son, right? So um, again, you read in Genesis, Abraham was pretty set on this. He says, be careful never to take my son there, meaning back home. Why? That would have been a safe place. For the Lord, the God of heaven, who took me from my father's house and my native land, solemnly promised to give this land to my descendants. So it was important for Isaac to stay put in the land of Israel, even though, as you can see, he still hadn't owned any land. He's just about to purchase a piece of land. So you can see how Abraham just kept on staying steadfast to God's promise and uh, his, his uh, covenant. The last section, you see the same thing also. What's interesting is after Sarah died, it says Abraham married another wife, Keturah, had many other descendants with Keturah. We often overlook that because we focus on Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, but Abraham was the father of many nations, including through Ishmael's lineage. I believe he also had 12 tribes. And here with Keturah, he had six other sons, uh, yet he gave everything he owned to Isaac. Kind of interesting point, right? Because Isaac was the son of the promise. But he also gave gifts to the sons of his concubines and sent them off to a land in the east away from Isaac. Because that was the land and the person through which God was going to accomplish his will. Um, and here the last bullet says, Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah, beside Sarah. Here's another interesting point. Why didn't they bury him beside Keturah? Now it doesn't say Keturah was dead or not, but kind of interesting that he'd been married for 35 years, or Sarah died 35 years ago, and they choose to bury him in that same place. Well, I'm guessing the story doesn't say it, but I'm guessing it's probably because Sarah had such an important place in, in the covenants, right? It was through Sarah and through Isaac, as you remember with Hagar. It wasn't through Hagar. It, wasn't, it was going to be through Sarah and through Isaac that God was going to fulfill his promise. So Abraham had a clear vision in his life, had a clear mission, and from 75 years old to 175 years old, as 100 years, even though he didn't fully see that come to fruition, he kept steadfast and just kept on walking. So in the Bible, and actually Hebrews, it talks a lot about the different heroes of the faith. There's other stories in there. You find the story of Joshua and Caleb through Rahab and how she had faith in hiding the, the spies and how people of Israel danced or, or walked around Jericho and defeated Jericho. You see the story of Joshua and Caleb. You also see the story of Moses. And this is where I wanted to connect this with some of our family uh, experiences and um, our, our family testimonies. So in a few years ago, I, I got the opportunity to go work in Israel. I work for Intel, and Intel has lots of employees there. There's a site in Haifa. And they asked me to come, and I was able to go for seven weeks. And I, yeah, awesome. And I told them, I said, if I'm going for seven weeks, I'm not going alone. You guys are coming with me. So brought the whole family. And while we were there, we got struck and we're like, our children were kind of aging. We had already, we had been talking about doing a bar mitzvah for them. That's something we had on our heart. And we're like, well, while we're in the land, why don't we find a way to do the bar mitzvah here? We knew a few people, but it was a struggle, let me tell you. It was a real struggle to figure out how to do their bar mitzvah in a way that was meaningful, at which place, which location. And it, it, most of the time we were there, it was a battle, kind of like the story of Joshua and Caleb, right? It was a battle. They were sent out with the 12 spies, came back. What did they say? We can do this. And there was a point where everyone was like, Francis, we need your direction. We need you to give us your leadership. And I, I have no idea how we're going to pull this together, but we're going to do just like Joshua and Caleb, because I knew that was my son's Torah portion. I said, we're going to do it by faith, and God is going to guide us through it, and he did. So what we'd like to do today is I'd like to bring up maybe, Ludwig, you can start first. Um, like I said, their Torah portion was um, the Numbers 13. Um, Armani's portion was connected around Moses, um, but they're going to mostly share their vision statement, what the Father laid on their heart at that point, and uh, it was a good refresher for them to go back to that and <laughs> reread it. 
Um, okay, hello, I'm Ludwig Rette, um, and when we went to Israel, I wrote a um, vision statement for um, my bar mitzvah, and this was actually in July 14th, 2018, so a couple of years ago. So um, this was this was my vision statement, thank you. Um, so uh, reflections on my Torah portion for my bar mitzvah was Numbers 13, 1, uh, 15, through 41. Um, I was really blessed to find out that my Torah portion was Numbers 13, 1, 15, 41, when the spies were sent out into the land of Canaan. In this story, obedience, perseverance, faith, and courage are all character traits Joshua and Caleb demonstrated. These are all character traits I want to apply to my life as well. In, in the beginning of my Torah portion, it says, The Lord spoke to Moses and told him, Sorry, I'm shaking. <laughs> Hold on, where was I? It says, The Lord spoke to Moses and told him to send out men to spy out the land of Canaan. It says, From each tribe of their fathers, you shall send a man, everyone a leader among them. Notice that it says, A leader among them. Then Moses told them to be of good courage and bring back some of the fruit of the land. I'm guessing fruit of land, like not only fruit, but the, not only like produce, but um, the, the good of the land. It wouldn't only mean the fruit of the land. Um, Moses chose 12 men, each from a different tribe, each of them leaders in their tribe. He probably chose leaders so that when they came back, they would have a greater impact than non-leaders would have. When they came, they did say good things about the land's produce, but unfortunately their report was tainted with fear. They said, we went to the land to which you sent us, and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is its fruit. But the people who live there are powerful, and the cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The, the Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, and the Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea. Um, and along the Jordan. We can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, they said the, land of, uh, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak, come from the Nephilim. We seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. Caleb's response was, we should go up at once and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it, because he had faith in the Lord, uh, that the Lord would help them. But that wasn't enough, because the people continued to weep and complain, let us go back to Egypt, so you really see the bad impact the other spies had. Although the ten spies reported good things about the land, their fear had a greater impact and caused the people to be paralyzed in fear. A lot of times, fear takes over our hearts, and even though there are good things to go after, the fear prevents us from grabbing God's blessings He has in store for us. Just like the ten other spies, Joshua and Caleb could have said, Oh, they're right, we can't do it. But no, they still had faith and courage to step up and tell the whole congregation, The land we have just passed is exceedingly good, and if the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into the land and give it to us. Indeed, Joshua and Caleb's faith, courage, and obedience towards the Lord was remarkable. There is another story in the Bible that I wish to talk about. It touches me in a special way. That is the story of King David and his submission towards the Lord. The story of King David is really a story that encourages me because he was called a man after God's own heart, and yet he sinned greatly. Sometimes people wonder how they can be forgiven or find it hard to understand that they can be forgiven because they have sinned so greatly. That's why the Lord, uh, sorry, that encourages me because uh, sometimes people wonder how they can be forgiven or find it hard to understand that they can be forgiven because they have sinned so greatly. That's why the Lord gave his only son that any bad thing we do um, is forgiven. Psalms 32 says, blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. That's how I can relate to David's story. I find it hard to accept forgiveness sometimes, but forgiveness has to be accepted for you to be forgiven. Be mindful that with sin always comes consequences and most often correction and has to be accepted for you to feel forget completely forgiven like David. 
He sinned, asked to be pardoned, punishment still applied, he accepted, and afterwards he felt completely forgiven. It isn't always easy to accept correction, but it doesn't mean it's bad for you. Actually, I think it's good for you because it helps you build up your character in different ways. David's submission towards the Lord is really a character trait that I want to acquire in my life. Submission is also to seek his will instead of yours. Like, for example, with David, even though he knew the Lord was with him, he inquired of the Lord, Shall I go up? Will you deliver them into my hands? And the Lord said, Go up, for I, wish, oh, I will surely deliver them into your hands. Also, also several, several times he had the chance to kill his enemy Saul, who always pursued him. But he always said, He is not in my hands, nor for me to deal with, for he is the Lord's anointed. So today, as I share my vision statement, I would like to ask you witnesses of my bar mitzvah to pray for me throughout my life and what the Lord, the Lord, has, the Lord has in store for me. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ludwig. Maximilian. Yeah, there was a struggle. Even just to write this down, there was just a struggle. Because I, I think when you're doing God's will, you should expect struggles, right? Abraham didn't have it easy. And we shouldn't just settle and say, yeah, I'm on the wrong direction because it's hard. No, it's, it's uh, with God's affirmation comes the strength of pers persevering. Continue. Hello, I'm Maximilian Rate. Um, my, well, obviously I'm a twin, so I have the same portion as it does, but from my perspective, sorry. Okay. Uh, reflection on my Torah portion for my Bar Mitzvah, Numbers 13 through 15. So I'll start with the introduction. As a brother of nine, well, now 11 siblings, <laughs> life can seem very busy. There's always somewhere, something new to do, somewhere new to go. Destinations take twice as long to get to, and with the oxen comes a dirty stable. Sometimes it can get frustrating and discouraging, and it's hard to see the love and joy that comes with living as a family. I remember the days I, when I used to wonder whether I wanted a big family or not, and for the most part I did, but sometimes it was as if fear gripped me and kept me from wanting one, whether God had planned one for me or not. Could it be that I was missing the love and fear of God? To me, it seems that when these key ingredients are missing, the fear of man is what quickly takes over. So, I would encourage you today to examine your hearts and make sure you're on the right side. Does your life consist of his fear love or the fear of man? Today, I would much like to talk about this fear of God and man, as it greatly relates to this Torah portion. First of all, the main part is about the 12 spies going out into the land. Two of them gave a good report, and the 10 others gave a bad one. Here is where I would like to start talking about the 10 bad reporters. These 10 spies were constantly displaying the fear of man. They saw giants. The cities were well fortified. They saw themselves as grasshoppers in their own sights. They wanted to select a leader to return to Egypt. Their fear even led them to wanting to stone Joshua and Caleb. We can plainly see that these ten spies were controlled by the fear of man and that their fear led them to no good at all. To me, it seems that the key ingredients that these ten, spy, ten spies were missing was a love for the Lord their God. It says here in 1 John 4.18, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment. Everything is just going in a circle. They have fear because they have no love for the Lord their God, and they also don't love the Lord their God because they have the fear of man. How? Because they have the fear of man. Uh, excuse me, I lost myself. Which basically means they aren't depending on their own God. And if they aren't depending on him, how can they have courage to face the enemy and enter the land? So let's name a few of the good ingredients these ten spies were missing. Love and fear are evidently two of them. Faith is clearly there as well. You can tell that they probably had no joy throughout the whole matter. To me, it seems that they were missing all the fruits of the Spirit, and overall, they probably had no good attributes at all. As punishment for their attitude and bad report, the Lord did not permit them to see the land which he had promised to them, nor did any who had rejected him. 
Now comes the best part where I would like to talk about Joshua and Caleb and their, the report that they gave. Let us go up and take possession of it, is the first remark Caleb makes. The land is exceedingly good. You can see right away, excuse me, you can see right away the positive attitude that they have. They're full of passion, courage, and faith. The Lord said to them in the wilderness, I will bring you into a land flowing with milk and honey. When I was younger, I used to picture a land with many creeks and rivers which were flowing with milk and honey instead of with water. But recently, I see it with, from a different perspective. To me, the milk part means life, and milk comes from cows, goats, and sheep, which basically means abundance. And for these animals to dwell on the land, there needs to be grass, in other words, vegetation. All of this points, uh, other words, vegetation. Same as with the honey. If you're going to have honey, you need bees. And for bees to produce honey, you need vegetation. All of this points to the fact that the land is green and fruitful and not barren and desolate. Sometimes it seems that God speaks in hidden ways, and it can get confusing and frustrating. I've experienced that quite a few times. But if you just humbly ask the Lord, don't doubt that he will answer you. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open. This is my commitment to God. I will overflow with his love and joy. I will fear him only. Fear of man will not control me. It is through his will and guidance that I will conquer Satan's de deceiving nature. The Lord is my God, and he shall be so forever and ever. I will be responsible in all that I am asked to do, small or great. I commit to stay as far away from sin and temptation as possible, and to stay as close as possible to his word. I vow to never doubt the greatness of God, and to always follow the path he has chosen for me. I am Maximilian August Rete, and this is my commitment. Shalom. Hey. Hermione was not a triplet with then, so she had a different Torah to portion, but she's going to focus more on her vision statements. Oh, hey, Shalom. Um, I'm going to, yeah, so I, I was also able, as my dad mentioned, to write a few reflections on my tour portion, which was Vaira, um, the portion with the, the last plagues and where, uh, of, that were put onto Egypt. Um, but while we were in Israel, the, our first trip, um, so I'm going to like read my vision statement, but while we were in Israel, um, I was encouraged by this young lady to um, write a vision statement that the Lord was like uh, a, a picture or something that the Father um, had that impressed on my, impresses on, she was like encouraging us, whatever the Father impresses on you, write your vision statement. Um, and um, that that's kind of be, will be like guide you in your life. Um, and it, it, it almost kind of sounds like prideful when you say it. Um, but in life, I feel there's always this, um, this perfect path that Yeshua walked on. And you can go to that one extreme where you're very prideful, or you can go to that other extreme where you're, you're humble, you're, but not, it's like extremely humble where you're like, um, saying I'm bad, I'm not, I'm nothing, I'm not good. But finding that perfect path where you should walk is finding our identity in Him and being humble in that. And so sometimes, uh, while I'm going to read this, it's gonna sound, it almost sounds prideful, but it's more of finding where I am uh, and who He says I am through Him. Um, <clears throat> yes. Uh, okay. So I'll, I'm going to read my vision statement. I am Armani Siara Hati. A sweet fragrance to the Lord, filling the house of Israel with the scent of his oil and bringing a pleasing aroma to the nations. I have proclaimed his righteousness and his salvation in the great congregation. No, I have not concealed his steadfast love from his people. Yahweh has appeared, and I will say, Behold, I come, as a bride ready to meet her bridegroom. On me he sets a crown of fine gold, and he dresses me in robes of pure linen. Yes, he adorns me with fine jewels. For I am his daughter, his servant, and his bride, and he is my Abba, my King, and my bridegroom. 
I eagerly search for wisdom, being sweeter than honey and the drippings of the honeycomb. My joy is his delight. I am deep within his steadfast love, and I delight to obey the word of Elohim. Yes, in my heart his law is written. My faith has been tested by fire, that it may be found to praise, honor, and glorify my master Yeshua. I am a daughter of Zion, a strong pillar within the courts of his palace. He has clothed me with strength and dignity. In the scroll of the book it is written of me, and the crown of life I am to receive. He has poured out on me his Holy Spirit, preparing me for his return to Jerusalem and for the work he has set before me, to advance his coming kingdom here on earth. In the morning my feet will rise up and worship him with dancing until the day dawns, for within the gates of Jerusalem my steps will be seen, for I have attained royal status for such a time as this. So, and I kind of want to relate to this too, with Abraham too, as you, you can see what you really stand, stood firm on God's promises and through this vision statement that I wrote, I, um, it, it helps me to stand on the vision that the Father has for my life and to really look forward to, to him um, changing me and molding me to per perfect this image that um, he, has, he, he, he has put before me. Um, and I would, I would really like to encourage you, um, if that's something the Father impresses on your heart, to write that vision statement, just to know who you are in Christ and Yeshua, our Messiah, um, and to really rely on that because it's easy to go to that one extreme where you're very prideful or to that other extreme where you're like, I'm nothing and I'm not good and I'm not, I'm, I'm bad. But in Yeshua, we are strong warriors and we are mighty and we wanted to praise him. So I would encourage you if that's something that the Father impresses on your heart. Amen. So, if you really stop and think about it, how many, I'm sure everybody here has seen the film Les Miserables? Les Miserables, Les Mis, we say Les Mis, there's a, most people have probably seen it, right? It's like everybody, and even in Ecclesiastes it says there's nothing new under the sun. So there's always some story that repeats in our lives, and in some sense, we are all Abraham's. God has called us to some great calling. He's got a purpose for our lives. And in some ways, we are also like Rebecca, who God has sent an apostle or someone to reach us and bring his bride to him to travel. And he's called us out of our land, out of our comfort zone. And our duty and our job is to respond to that and to be obedient and to walk in trust, really. Right? So to help bring this and put some kind of vision to this. One of our, our first trips actually in Israel was in 2015, and it happened, it was during the High Holy Days, and during Sukkot, if you've been to Israel, how many people have been to Israel? During Sukkot or Yom Kippur, it's, it's quite something. So during Sukkot, as soon as Yom Kippur is done, people start taking out their boards and everything, and they start building their sukkah, and you see all, these things built everywhere, right? It's kind of interesting. And here's a bunch of them in their balconies. So Emil has a short story, but I think it's pretty powerful. Okay, so um, for me, it kind of starts, we were, it was, you know, the high holy days, and I was, we were driving down the road, and because we're a big family, you know, they don't really make huge cars over there, so we had to rent two cars. And so it mixed that uh, my dad was in the lead and my mom was uh, in the rear. And we we're going down this like little, kind of little back road with cars parked on both sides and it's, it was kind of like a one-way road. Um, and then all of a sudden there's this guy and he's trying to cross the road with like a cart that's kind of dingy, but he's trying to pull it across the road and he kind of has this mental issue. Um, yeah, phys physical and mental issue. So he's not kind of, you know, making the best of it. And so we kind of have to stop and wait for him. We're fine with that. But um, then all of a sudden there's this, uh, you know, cars kind of start to pile up behind us. And then I remember we had a friend with our mom in the back and she was telling, you know, you know, just honk at him. You know, he, he has to move out of the way. And uh, then all the people behind were honking, and finally me and my brother, we got out. We're like, we're going to try to help this guy, you know, get across. And so we did help him, or another guy came, and, you know, finally it was all cleared, and we moved. And I remember when we came back home, or to the apartment that night, 
um, I, my heart was heavy just because I saw that, you know, sometimes in life we're so in a hurry and we don't see that what's in front or we don't see what's stopping us or what's making us slow down. Sometimes, you know, for me personally, I have a certain hard time with either being its siblings or parents or, you know, sometimes it could be the government or who knows what. But, um, yeah, that was kind of what I pulled from that story. Yeah. We don't see what's in front, right? Could be all kinds of things that block us. But sometimes you have to step out and go figure out what's happening. Sometimes you just have to sit back, be patient, and it's part of God's plan to slow us down. So I, I, I want to bring this also. It's, you know, we, we've been living through COVID mania. I don't know what to call it, COVID frenziness. And it's been, what, roughly two years now? Abraham stood firm for 100 years on his promise. And he lived in Canaan. And in some sense, we might feel like America's turning to Canaan. And in some sense it is, but let's hold firm and let's not forget this here, right? We need to live in faith like Abraham did. It's impossible to please God without faith. You want to please God, there's a simple thing you can do. I'm a dad, I know what it means when my children trust me, right? Because they know that I'm capable and they know I love them. It, it's, a, it's, it's, just, it's an expression of their love towards me. And the Father is just the same. He wants us to trust in Him. He is sovereign. He can do everything. He loves us. He knows what's best for us. Sometimes we think this is better for us, but He knows exactly what's better. He knows better than we do. Anyone who wants to come to Him must believe that God exists and that He rewards those who sincerely seek Him. Hebrews 11, 6. So with that, I wanted to bring Eva up for... <laughs> She's my, my best partner <laughs> in life. <laughs> 20, 24 years and... Do you have questions? Okay. And uh, we... Uh, let me see. This part was not rehearsed, by the way. This is completely <laughs> impromptu. Yeah, I just had it on my heart as he was showing. I, I, it's as if I went back to the land just seeing this um, picture. But... Um, I was pregnant with Jerusha. She's now five years old at the, uh, on this picture. And um, I remember we were praying. We we're, were very diligent at praying about our children's, what our, our newborn's name will be. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me. And we were praying, and uh, I, when I went on Ilan Moray, so this is a mountain, and I started a ball because um, this is where Abraham stood. And I was like, I'm there where he stood. And I just felt so touched that um, to first to have the opportunity to be there, and also that my forefather was there and looking like you can see, you can see the whole land. When a, on a clear day, you can see very far, and and you see, and I just felt like that um, Abba was uh, giving me that, that same word, like you, you are mine and I want you in my land. And, and so, um, and my promises are yours. And so I was so touched by this, uh, this, that I was like, well, can we maybe incorporate like Elon or Moray or something in, in Jerusha's name? And, um, but anyway, we continued to pray, and um, and uh, in uh, Jerusha, she was our tenth child, and um, Jerusha is uh, the mother of the tenth king of Israel. And Jerusha, in the meaning of uh, when we found her name, in the meaning of her name, it's it's it's. Um, um, one of the meaning is that she's mar married, but not in the sense of a, to a man, but married to the land. And, um, and it's basically what Abraham was, like he's married to the land. And I just was so blessed to, when we found our name, but also our second name was Cadence. And that's where I want to encourage you as well. Uh, Cadence is a, is a rhythm. And uh, during that time as well, uh, we, um, Yahweh was pressing on my heart to, um, you know, he showed us his Shabbat, he showed us his feast, but to really um, 
I was like, Father, show me what you want of me, of us. And he, he showed us his, his, his rhythm. And his, And I want to encourage you, This when we go to uh, his cadence, his rhythm, uh, it's everything is so uh, perfectly uh, woven together. And just to um, sit on his promises and uh, to, to walk in his footstep at his cadence and not our own beat and our, not our own. Our our own, our own drum, but uh, to really um, to really build his kingdom here on earth and not our own kingdom. So I just want to encourage you to to uh, walk in, in his cadence, and he will show it to you. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> and I just want to express how blessed I am to be married to this wonderful woman this week. You know, I think we all have these moments of. I just feel inadequate, and I literally, I said, I think I'm going to call Roland, and I'm not going to be able to do it this Shabbat, because I just, I had this moment this week, and I think when, when you're trying to do something for the Lord, I think the enemy is just going to put roadblocks, and I had this really serious roadblock this week, and um, I've said, Francis, the Lord uses broken men, the, the Lord uses, and if you listen to what Ludwig said about the story of King David, King David recognized his failings and he just moved forward and he continued to be the king of Israel and he was a man after God's own heart. So let me just want to encourage you, walk by faith, trust the Father. He knows what you need. He knows he's in control and we are called to walk by faith just like Abraham did. Nice job. Man. Francis, thank you so much. Are we going to start walking the walk of Abraham's faith? Yes? <laughs> Abraham's faith. And are you going to create a vision? <laughs> Write it down. And if you haven't seen Les Miserables, do so. Francis, I've gone to that and seen it four, four times, live performance. And it's all about that vision and walking in faith. Thank you for sharing your faith. Family, thank you for sharing your faith. Thank you for sharing your testimony and encouraging all of us. I just, this is a wonderful Sabbath.